Hello, welcome to this experiment in automated proctoring that we will be presenting in more detail on the Emux 2016 in Graz. Um, my name is Thomas Staubitz, I'm a research associate at the Hasselblad Institute and um, there I'm working uh, on the OpenHBI platform team and I've also been a member of a couple of OpenHBI teaching teams. OpenHBI is the MOOC platform that we are providing from the HBI and where we are running our courses, courses that are provided from the HBI. Uh, we are also running another instance of this platform for SAP, which is OpenSAP or OpenSAP, uh, where they are providing their courses, but the software base of the platforms is identical, more or less identical. Um, around OpenHBI and OpenSAP, we have uh, built a couple of other products. One of them is MOOC, which is a um, um, MOOC aggregator, a MOOC search engine, and um, CodeOcean, which is a platform to run and to assess code. And then we have MOOC House, which is rather new, uh, where we are opening up the platform not only for users, for participants, but also for course providers. So we invite everybody um, to join and to provide courses there. And then last but not least, we have a couple of instances uh, of our platforms running also in China. Um, so yeah, we are talking about proctoring here, on an experiment in, in automated proctoring. And um, to get started with, we did a survey a couple of years ago um, to see if the users are interested in more valid or more trusted certificates at all. And then also we asked them how much they would be willing to pay for something like that. And um, well, a quarter of them was sort of interested and um, those that were willing to pay anything at all said, oh, it has to be less than 100, better less than 50 euro. Um, but of course, uh, not only the participants of these courses are the stakeholders in this, in this topic, but also um, us as the course providers, for example. And we have an interest in being able to identify or to proctor uh, our users because we want to offer, for example, ECTS credits. And um, thus, we hope to be able to expand our user base. Currently, we mostly have uh, professionals, and um, we hope that we can attract more students, for example, to um, visit our courses and to participate in our courses. Um, of course, generating income also is an issue that we have to think about. And, um, so we tried to define two terms and we said, well, we have proctoring on the one side, which is a, like a really in-depth surveillance of the users, by, mostly by humans or actually by humans, and um, which means that um, with proctoring, we, don't, we do not only check if um, this is the correct user in front of the camera, but also if um, he or she doesn't cheat in ways of using material that is not allowed to be used in this exam, for example. So we can um, go for like more closed book or more open book exams, for example. With an identity check, we just check the identity of the user. So is the registered, registered user actually, actually doing the exam in front of the camera? Um, <clears throat> so our main question was, can we replace human proctoring by an automated solution? And um, okay, probably we can't replace the, the full-fledged human proctoring, but we can get very close to that. And we um, made a test, and or we made a couple of tests, an alpha test and a beta test. And in the alpha test, we had about uh, 17 participants in the beta test, 49 participants, and in one case, in the first case, it was colleagues and it was a closed uh, thing, and in the other case, um, we had regular, uh, regular OpenHBI course where we asked some of the participants to join us. And um, in the first case, in the alpha test, we predefined ways of cheating. In the second case, in the beta test, we, we 
ask the students to, or the participants to be creative and to invent and report about what they did. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in both cases, the um, system detected if people were holding a picture in front of the camera. It also, of course, detected if the students just went away uh, or if they switched places with somebody else. And it also detected pretty clearly that there was more, more than one person in front of the camera. Um, we had some issues, minor technical issues, with a few, few browsers or browser settings, especially on Linux, but um, nothing that can't be handled. And um, there was one case in the beta test when actually a user held a picture in front of the camera. We had that detected in the, in the alpha test pretty clearly. Uh, in the beta test, there was one user that held a, front, a picture in front of the, the camera, which was detected by the machine, uh, but then later on was corrected by a human controller that is, like in, in questionable cases, having a second clock on these things. And so Small already has uh, changed their procedure to, or improved their procedure to, to avoid failures like this. So uh, also with the beta test and uh, with the alpha test as well, we did some service. Um, here's some results from the beta test. So we had, before, before we started with the Brock ring, uh, we had asked the students if they want to join uh, this experiment. Um, and then we also asked them why they did say they do not want to join. And there were quite a couple of uh, people that did not want to join. Uh, so as you maybe have seen, we had about 49 uh, participants in the, in, the proctoring, in the proctoring test and um, in a course with uh, 10,000 participants. And very much of them said, oh, we just don't have time for, for this right now, uh, for such tests. But um, most, uh, most of the most of the answers were they were very uh, concerned with the privacy issues. And that was surprising for me. A lot of users said we just don't have a webcam, especially when we're doing the courses from our workplace. And um, also, as you can see here, nothing has changed too much in comparison between uh, the first survey two years ago and this uh, second survey. Uh, during the beta test, so still about a quarter of the participants would be interesting in interested in general in a more valid uh, certificate, and um, still they are not interested in paying too much, less than 100, better less than 50 euros. So what we need to do if we want to have something like that is to um, explain how much more valid such a certificate, for example, would be for the users. So we, it's not the proctoring that adds the, the, the uh, value. It's, for example, these DS points. Um, so to come to the conclusion, um, more trusted certificates are not a major concern for our current user group. And uh, our goal is to attract new target groups by offering more trusted certificates with additional benefits. And um, an identity check is not equal to proctoring, um, but we can do most of it, kind of, we, we can, can compensate that in, in certain ways. And um, as uh, in regards to small, the company that we worked with, they are based in Europe, with what, which, was, uh, which was a basic concern by some of our users that didn't want to have their private data, such as photos, for example, go to the US. You maybe remember this discussion about the safe harbor policy a couple of uh, weeks ago um, in the context with Coursera. And um, also, they offer a reasonable pricing for long-term user verification. Uh, so if you don't want to just proctor one exam in depth, but you want to give like more um, broad verification throughout all the exams that happened during such a course. Um, and then don't go in depth, too, mu in too much depth about the actual, what the users are using. And you can handle that or you can work around that with, uh, for example, with the uh, more strict timing for such um, exams. 
And of course, there's no 100% security, but what we can do is we can significantly, significantly raise the bar for cheaters. And yeah, I'm looking forward to see you in Graz and hope for some interesting discussions here on the MOOC platform.